Ja, hallo und herzlich willkommen zum allerersten Wandersalon on Air von Urbane Künste Ruhr. And a very warm welcome to all international guests watching today as well. Zu Gast ist heute die Künstlerin Natalie Bookchin und gemeinsam mit Britta Peters, die seit 2018 die künstlerische Leiterin von Urbane Künste Ruhr ist, wird sie gleich über ihre Arbeit sprechen und dabei auch ein ganz neues Projekt vorstellen. Das Gespräch findet auf Englisch statt. The talk will be in English. Ich selbst bin Christina Danik und betreue die Veranstaltungsreihe Wandersalon bei Urbane Künste Ruhr. Und der Wandersalon ist ein reisendes Veranstaltungsformat und normalerweise macht er an verschiedenen Orten im Ruhrgebiet Halt. Wir laden dazu KünstlerInnen ein, von ihrer Arbeit zu berichten oder veranstalten Lesungen, Lecture-Performances oder Diskussionen. Und inhaltlich bereitet der Wandersalon jeweils unser jährlich stattfindendes Ausstellungsprojekt Ruhrding vor, das von Britta Peters kuratiert wird. Die kommende Ausgabe, das Ruding Klima, findet im Mai und Juni 2021 in Haltern, Herne, Gelsenkirchen und Recklinghausen statt. Und heute versuchen wir uns zum allerersten Mal an einer Online-Ausgabe des Wandersalons und ähm, die US-amerikanische Künstlerin Natalie Bookchin dazu ein, zu laden, bot sich aus vielerlei Hinsicht total gut an, denn äh, sie lebt in Brooklyn, New York und hätte in der augenblicklichen Situation ähm, kaum an einem Live-Wandersalon im Ruhrgebiet teilnehmen können. Aber was noch eigentlich viel wichtiger ist, sie arbeitet selbst in vielfältiger Art und Weise im und mit dem Internet. Und das sind unter anderem interaktive Websites und Online-Games. In den letzten Jahren arbeitet sie vermehrt auch mit filmischem Found Footage aus dem Netz, welches sie zur Auf- und Gesamtkomposition verwirrt. Aber Natalie Bitschen setzt sich nicht nur formal mit dem Internet auseinander, sondern beschäftigt sich auch auf inhaltlicher Ebene ähm, mit seinen sozialen, wirtschaftlichen und politischen Dimensionen. Natalie Bookchin hat bereits im MoMA PS1 im Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, in den Kunstwerken in Berlin, der Generali Foundation in Wien, dem Walker Art Center und dem Whitney Museum of American Art ausgestellt. Und 2012 hat sie den renommierten MacArthur Foundation Film Grant erhalten. Und wir freuen uns sehr, dass sie heute beim Wandersalon zu Gast ist. Ähm, in der Chat-Funktion ähm, rechts neben der Übertragung können jederzeit Fragen gestellt werden, die wir Nathalie am Ende des Gesprächs dann stellen werden. Und jetzt übergebe ich an Britta Peters und Nathalie Bürkchen und wünsche viel Spaß beim Wandersalon und er. Ja. Ja. Vielen Dank, äh, Christina, für die Einführung. Thank you, Christina, for the short introduction. I'm very happy to introduce uh, today Natalie Bookchin and to talk to her about her artistic approach, some elder artworks and the new project Geisterspiele, which means ghost games according to the German soccer games without audience and which we are preparing for our next exhibition, Wording, in 2021. Wording is the title of an exhibition format for the Ruhr area, which I brought with me when I came in 2018 and which is supposed to be shown in May, June each year. In this frame set, we realized 15 up to 20 projects, all new productions in various spots in the region. Most of them in public space. For some projects, we cooperate with existing institutions from the art fields as well as from other disciplines. Urbane Kunst itself is an institution without an exhibition space. I got very interested in Natalie's work a long time ago when I saw mass ornament, which we are going to see later in the talk, in a show in Hamburg. But since we do site specific installations, I wasn't sure how to integrate her position into our project. Then when the Corona pandemic started and the shutdown and the race of digital communication became a quite common experience, I felt that this situation could be addressed as a global site. I invited Natalie to produce a new work for our exhibition, referring on this experience, and here we go. Natalie, in preparation of, preparation of our talk, I went to the depths of your website, which is an interesting archive, not only of your artworks since 30 years, but also of recent media development and how the digital world changed within the, this period of time. Among the words, With the works you did in the early 90s, I found a series of embroideries, which seems interesting to me for various reasons. I picked one from 1990 to talk about because it's connected to the fall of the Berlin Wall. 
American Sampler is the title. So maybe you can show it to us. Um, so my image, let's see, my image appears to be frozen. Can you hear me? I hear you very well. Okay. But my image isn't moving. Oh, shit. So you cannot, you cannot uh, share your screen? Yeah, I can. Well, I'll share my screen and we can, we can see it. The title. So maybe you can show it to us. Um, sure. You can tell me if this works. Yes, it works. You can see that. You, can see that. you just can't see my face. Interesting. <laughs> okay, so hi everyone. And, and it's really nice to be here and, and to talk with Britta, even under these very strange and trying circumstances. Um, so this is, I don't know if you said this, but this is, this is I think your first experiment with, with doing an online talk. And it's also mine. I mean, besides teaching, I haven't, I've been avoiding doing online talks. So, because um, it's very strange. Uh, but anyway, so just to talk a little bit about uh, uh, this work, American Sampler and, and embroidery, why embroidery? I mean, you can see by the sampler, by the work that I'm not an embroiderer. In fact, my skills are, are really non-existent. Um, and I made this piece, this was the first in a series that I made where I, where I used embroidery to translate television or newspaper images or texts. Um, and this one is called American Sampler, which is after a tradition of the sampler, which was um, in the pre-modern period, it was a teaching tool for girls. So it was how girls learned how to be, you know, proper, proper housewives and daughters and, you know, maintain their function within the house. So they would do needlework on biblical verse and on the alphabet. Um, and so uh, I was watching um, television when Dan Rather and Connie Chung, who are uh, American, very famous newscasters, were um, having this dialogue. And uh, Dan Rather was in front of the Berlin Wall as it was coming down in November of 1989. And Connie Chung was at home in the studio. And, uh, and so they had this, this, you know, sort of really rapid dialogue of an event that happened you know, sort of live and was transient and passing. And I decided that I wanted to uh, slow it down and, uh, and pay attention to the language itself. And I was thinking about the way that television, of course, you know, sort of like any other kind of folklore or tradition, you know, translates news events in a way that, uh, you know, tells a particular story. So this event, that they were discussing was called A Night to Remember. I mean, it had a little caption underneath it. And so I was just uh, thinking about the domestic space as a space that's not separate from the public space, the way that uh, television comes into our home. And, uh, you know, so this of course references the domestic space, but also the domestic space as one of femininity, right? As if that were somehow outside of the world. And so, um, yeah, it was a kind of uh, interesting to think about this piece because I haven't thought about it in nearly 30 years since I made it. And I was trying to remember what I was thinking about, but that's sort of, yeah, it had to do with the kind of the mediation, like how, how media mediates and reshapes how we know and understand the world. And this is the reason why I picked it. I, I, I imagine that you uh, haven't, uh, dealt with it quite a long time because it's from 1990. It's really early piece, but I, I felt that your artistic approach reflecting on media, reflecting on public and private sphere, and also using in this case, a very feministic tools by uh, re referring on the embroidery uh, is quite visible in there. So I felt it's a nice conceptual piece and maybe good to start with before we enter uh, the completely digital sphere. And another project caught my attention. It's called BAD, Bad, Burn the Ad World Down, based on text, emails, and website, and was produced 1997 to 1999, together with the UK-based artist Heath Bunting. For me, it is, very interesting. it is a very interesting proof of that special period of time, which is marked by the globalization, starting after the fall of the Iron Curtain, the rays of digital communication and all the utopian ideas connected with both. 
Can you tell us a bit more about the project? It seems quite funny with all the fake texts, for example, by Peter Weibel, Weibel and other prominent media researchers and theoreticals. Yeah, um, so this, I, I was so happy that you brought this up because I, I don't think I've ever, or I mean, again, it's, it, I mean, or if I have talked about it, it's been, it's been a really long time, but it is right now really interesting, I think, to think back to early net history and early net art history, uh, just because of where we are. And I, you know, sort of at the end of one era and now entering another, maybe, maybe we've got through two eras since I made this work in 97. So I started working on the net the year that I made this work, and that was 1997, it's, you might have said, or I said already. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I kind of stumbled on it as I was doing research for something else. I stumbled on a, a small group of artists, uh, international artists on a mailing list who were, um, you know, sort of thinking about the internet, which at the time, you know, there was no video on the internet. I mean, it was really, it was really very, very basic. It was HTML, um, the web, that is not the internet, the web, the World Wide web had only been around for a couple of years, you know, since the mid nineties or yeah, 93 or 90, four. 1995 maybe can, marked, uh, can be marked as the beginning of uh, emailing and all this digital communication, is that right? It's like no, I mean it happened much. It happened much earlier, but it was it was it was done without the. Uh, I mean, it was ARPANET, so the internet was founded by the military, and so uh, scientists and academics were communicating, you know, sort of uh, through computers before that on networks. Yeah, I uh, meant but, but the web, the web browser was. I no, think it was nineteen. It was around nineteen ninety four, nineteen ninety five. Someone in the audience probably is, is shaking their heads and correcting us on the precision. But it was like right around then. So, so it was only a few years after that. And I, um, you know, I was an artist too, as you could see, was working. I, I mean, I, I wasn't. I came out of photography, but I was working in a lot of different media. Um, I was really driven. I mean, my work was conceptual. It was really driven more by the idea but it always referred back to the world or the document. And there was always some kind of sort of social and political thought, like connection with, 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 the, with the world and with things happening in the world. I became really excited about the possibility of the internet um, as a space, like as a site or a non-site to not just, or in fact to not post uh, other work and promote it, but as a site in itself, like to consider what is this, what, you know, what are the possible ways of thinking about, um, you know, distribution, uh, communication, you know, through networks that changes, I think everything. I mean, we know now it has changed everything. And at the time it seemed to me like it was a, you know, it was a profound, a profound uh, invention. And there were, because there were so few artists on it, I mean, I was perplexed because I thought like, this is really a critical place, especially for artists who are thinking critically uh, to, to, you know, to locate themselves because there's so much work to be done to kind of address what's happening and to not just celebrate, which is what many of the internet pioneers were doing, not just kind of celebrate the democratic possibilities of it, but to assess what the, what, you know, what are the kind of questions that sit behind those claims and the, those booster kind of slogans about internet democracy. So anyway, um, on the one hand, there was that. And on the other hand, I saw it as a way to, um, and I guess this was maybe not utopian, but optimistic, as a way to circumvent what I thought was a very um, uh, conservative and um, hierarchical art world. That it would be a way for me, maybe not to escape that, because I don't think you could be outside of it, but to have a different kind of relationship with people who see my work, to potentially uh, reach people who might not walk into a gallery. So, so I had, I, I was, you know, I was both really curious about it, and I also thought it, that like some kind of critique needed to happen on it. So Heath and I um, started uh, distributing texts um, that I mostly wrote um, and he distributed that were, I mean, one of the things that happened just to backtrack a little is that I also found that the tech world and the tech, the computer art world was also really uh, patriarchal and conservative and white and male. And so it, there was no escaping the world, whether you're online or offline. 
And so we, but, but the distribution possi possibilities were different. And so we did a kind of fake, uh, fake news, like before the right appropriated <laughs> fake news, I would say uh, groups like Artmark that I was a part of and, uh, you know, Keith and I in this little, in this, you know, sort of smaller scale project, uh, you know, tried to appropriate it an anonymity, um, distributing texts without signing them or signing them in other people's names as a way to provoke and to raise kinds of questions about, about power and privilege on the internet. Uh, a couple of years after we did that, um, I decided to, uh, to collect them and to make a fake magazine where I housed all of them. And, yeah. so, and so that's what this is. You could, I illustrated it. Uh, yeah, that's super <laughs> nice. I think it's really worth to get, uh, to get deeper into that because it's, yeah. it's funny and it's a nice uh, document of the spirit of this time or among these people, like your group of people, um, uh, trying to do other things with the internet and to, to establish maybe another art world or use other um, tools. Yeah, yeah. There, there is another one like from the early works which is also very interesting uh, nowadays because I think that especially the younger ones, they don't remember that there was a time where we had a, a lot of search engines. Nowadays, everything is kind of reduced to um, only few, Google and so on and so on. Maybe you can um, show us searching for the truth. Sure. So this is this is a, a net art piece that I did in um, 2000, and it's it's called Searching for the Truth. In the past, when you had web browsers, you had a title for a page. So at the top of it, you would see Searching for the Truth on it. Um, and what you see here are hot links, and each one of them goes to a different search. What was at the time um, a different search engine. So the, there were nine functional search engines in 2000 and when i searched for the truth on each of them i came up with this amount these amounts of truths so if you click on 666 for example you get um let's see what search engine is that yahoo <laughs> okay so yahoo and you can see it doesn't even tell you the amount you get there um but i'm sure it's more than 666 and then if you click on this one excite apparently is still around and i know google is somewhere here i think Ada vista is gone for example which one is then which one was it? i don't oh google, here's google so at the time uh, we'll go back to the number but now there are 978 million uh, results for truth um but i think that one was 364 so so i i think uh, for me looking back at it um, it, it speaks to the role of algorithms in determining what counts as truth, right? Um, that uh, there used to be on the net, it wasn't a great place, it was a, but it was a better place in the sense that it was, you know, it was less, less um, you know, the, the walls and the barriers uh, for access and for distribution were much lower. And so now we have one main search engine. There are a few others, but mainly everybody uses one. So only one commercial proprietary algorithm, you know, sort of that, that or algorithms determined by Google, um, you know, filter what counts as truth. And so, yeah, so at, at the time, I mean, I was sort of interested in, in the algorithmic question, but I think it's become even more critical and, por and important today, especially as as there's so much control, like so much control, you know, sort of within only a very few, hands of very few people. Yeah, it seems like the privatization of public space in the like real physical space now took place in the internet or in the digital sphere as well. It's a privatization of information and this, this work is from 2000 and the other works we saw were from the 90s. So if you think about today, 2020, um, this development is already in another, in another uh, point, as you said, there is only Google. I used to work for Alta Vista in this day, so I remember all these uh, search engines. From 2005 till 2007, you made some landscape pieces edited from the source of security webcams. 
which seemed to me as the beginning of a process which ended in the multi-layered, often found footage-based portraits you later got famous with. Um, I thought about maybe skipping the landscape pieces and um, watching together a short sequence of parking lot um, because this one, I think, came in 2008, so maybe it's, uh, it's based on the landscape uh, pieces made from security webcams, but what we see there is also very much connected to public space or to the public use of private space, in this case means uh, shopping malls and parking lots, and so I think it's very interesting and also, again, funny and very uh, nice edited, so maybe we can see a sequence of that. Sure. I'm in a parking lot, a parking lot, parking lot at Costco, a parking lot, a parking lot in a handicapped spot. I'm in a parking lot at Costco, waiting in the car. Where are you going to go, Liz? Which parking spot? <laughs> It's the police! Oh shit! Get the dog! Hey, Billy can do it, ah! I see you! I see you! Staring out the windows and looking at me because you're sweating me because my flow is like silk, leaving you ignorant because you know that you are bound by limitations and you respect your boundaries. That's why you never step across this line. Yeah, you did. My question was how um, how you came up with the idea to uh, to do the parking lots and how it was how where did you find the material and how it was edited. This was basically it. Okay, so uh, when I made that video in two thousand and eight, that was ten years, eleven years after I had started working on the internet and, 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 and the project that you saw with with, with Heath Heath Bunting, Bunting had been done. done. And, and the, the internet, internet was a completely different place. YouTube had been founded only a couple of years earlier. And you can see by the quality of videos that video circulating on the internet was still really basic. Yeah. Uh, quality, I, find, I actually find that, that image quality really beautiful, but it's really, really low res. Uh, but in any case, uh, um, 
I, the, 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 the internet, internet had become a place where there, there were an enormous amount of gates now. now. It, was it was a very, you know, it was a pri privatized space that, that the public could, could use. And, and I thought that, that there was an analogy between the way that people uh, appropriated, like, like made these contemporary uh, sort, sort of interventions, interventions so, so that they could play and have fun and, 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 and uh, I don't, I don't know, know, substitute um, the spaces, spaces that, that didn't exist you know, in the public realm. Yeah, because, it's of the shrink, because of the, pink, the shrinking public space, people would use parking lots. Um, and so I thought of the internet in the same way that people would use sites like like YouTube, you know, to to share their 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 little rebellious interventions. And then within that, what would happen is other people would see it. And I mean, it was the beginning of the idea of virility, right? Like in the way that I edited it was that, you know, one one would beget another, would beget another, would beget another. Like on the internet, you never just see one video. You always see, you know, a kind of video conversation or chain of videos. Right. So that's the way I was thinking about the editing in terms of, you know, how do you represent that kind of, I mean, that's something that I go into much deeper as I, as I move forward in a different way with multiple, uh, you know, images on a, on a single screen. But I, but I wanted to talk about, even though, like on the, uh, so on the one hand, you could say that, uh, you know, there's nothing original about those interventions, like because everyone is doing them. So they're not really subversive because, but on the other hand, I, I was thinking that, well, actually, you know, th there is a kind of subversiveness to uh, the way that many people can see what people are doing and then they want to do more. Yeah, and the, and the film okay. itself, is, it's, it's much longer. So you have a big variety of what people do in parking lots. <laughs> so. And now, I mean, because of our, because of the strange context, you know, the strange uh, and devastating uh, pandemic that we're living in. Uh, people, I just saw recently people in the parking lot having a picnic with their children and letting, the, you know, so the children can bike around because uh, no one else is around, right? So they drive in. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> it's, a, it's a safe place because a lot of the playgrounds have been closed. Now they're open again, which is even worse, but yeah. that's going in another place. So uh, I think I answered your questions. Yes, thank you. And um, I read an interview where you were referring to Hitler Style's text um, in defense of the poor image. And I thought maybe it's nice um, to get into this because indeed it corresponds very much with the aesthetic and political questions uh, underlining your artworks. Um, and so I uh, maybe I give a very, very short summary um, of one of her theses. Uh, and that's that within the last 30 years, the fetish of high resolution images in cinema and TV has produced the displacement of experimental and essay films from the mainstream media. At the same time, many works of avant-garde, essayistic and non-commercial cinema have been res resurrected as poor images now circulating accessible for almost everybody in the digital sp sphere. She, she writes, the network in which poor images circulate thus constitutes both a platform for a fragile new common interest and a battleground for commercial and national agendas. They contain experimental and artistic material, but also incredible amounts of porn and paranoia. And now I skip the part. Poor images are thus popular images, images that can be made and seen by the many. They express all the contradictions of the contemporary crowd. It's opportunism, narcissism, desire for autonomy and creation, it's inability to focus or make up its mind, it's constant readiness for transgression and simultaneous sub submission. Altogether, poor images present a snapshot of the effective condition of the crowd, its neurosis, paranoia, and fear, as well as its craving for intensity, fun, and distraction. The condition of the images speaks not only of countless transfers and reformatings, but also of the countless people who care enough about them to convert them over and over again to add subtitles, to re-edit or upload them. And I thought well, this is a very nice um, essay. It uh, was written for the Eflux magazine quite some years ago. Uh, and I think this fits because I caught myself uh, by thinking about parking lot, lot when we were uh, 
speaking about giving like a preview on uh, Facebook for our talk, I thought, oh, well, the quality is so low. People will kind of skip immediately. And uh, now I think it's really nice to think about um, this relationship between high and uh, technical demands uh, and uh, the, the so-called poor imagery as uh, Hito Style did. And I guess this is also a very good introduction to mass ornament, uh, which uh, I would like to uh, show now together with you. It's uh, from 2009. Sure, I'll, I will, I'm gonna show just a, a couple, they're two separate um, uh, very short excerpts that I put together. So it'll be one and then there'll be a moment and then there'll be another. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, just a just a teaser. <laughs> yes. Um, maybe you you tell us a bit um, about the production right away. Well, I will say first that it's just really funny these days to look at uh, what people are doing with Zoom. Yeah. Because even, because even you know, I made this in a long time ago. And now it's been realized in a certain way, but the different, the very big difference is that all of the images were found, and people were not choreographing their dance movements to each other <laughs> in yeah. that same way. I mean, they are in a sense. So everything was found. All of the, uh, all of this was found on, uh, again, on on uh, YouTube, and there were videos that people made of themselves dancing alone in their rooms back because it was made. And the videos were collected in 2008. Uh, people mostly, I don't, I think that the iPhone came out uh, just a few years before. Uh, I don't remember the date offhand. But, mm. Okay. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, most people still use webcams uh, attached to their desktop computers. So there were, so people spent a lot of time just like we do today in our rooms. <laughs> <laughs> in front of computers yeah. and uh, and I was thinking about the way that when I was growing up I would dance in front of a mirror That's and true. now people use were using the computer as a kind of mirror you know that they you could see yourself but you were also imagining an audience so you know and actually being rewarded on YouTube um, for the number of views that you would get which is why even though it's an archive so those view numbers are not move, moved. You know, I, I included the view num the views or that people had taken off their video at the time that I went back to 
to check on it. Um, and I guess one of the questions I sometimes get is like, what, what do you think about privacy in relationship to that work? And uh, my answer is that um, I really think that it's important to document like sort of public life. And I don't think that the work is a direct document, but I try to be very sensitive to the document and to what uh, the kind of, like I, I try not to mimic or to make fun of or to um, undermine something when I use something from the world. But I still think it's important to, to show and because I think we have a better understanding of ourselves and you know, how we, how we negotiate these mediated spaces by seeing these things. And the other thing is that it's not, it, the, the strange thing that the views remind us is that there's a mixture of exhibitionism and voyeurism. People are choosing to put themselves up and want to be seen. I mean, it speaks to the lack of, the lack of, you know, sort of places where people can be public, again, in a different way that people really want want that kind of publicity. I mean, maybe in the older way of using that term. This was also, a, a, before YouTube got taken over by pro-tubers and professionalism. So, so it's really, you know, people were much more free, I think, and um, spontaneous in the kinds of videos that they made. Yeah. And so, so yeah, that's, that's uh, the work was um, putting together a mass dance of the kind of, repetitive gestures and movements that people made alone imagining, you know, imagining a collective. Yeah, it's very, it's very powerful. And there is one thing I noticed by seeing it again now, you had some um, images with the room itself with no uh, person in it. And this leads us somehow uh, to the ghost games or guys that feel it we are going to talk about uh, in a minute. Uh, but there is a very strong link to uh, Siegfried Krakauer, even in the title, uh, the German book is um, the, the, Das Ornament der Masse, and I think the English title is Masse Ornament. Yeah. And uh, this also uh, fits uh, to what you just said, because um, Krakauer was always, uh, a, he was a philosopher and a journalist, and his um, critique or his attitude towards the like normal daily life and towards what um, people enjoy doing was uh, to see it and to analyze it as the mirror of society and not to um, kind, of, kind of look down more to accept that this is, uh, this is uh, the society. And so I think this fits also very much to your attitude you just, just described, how, how to Uh, work with the material, not in a voyeuristic way, but more like trying to understand, trying to analyze, and uh, somehow also appreciating that uh, this is the way um, people want to show themselves by dancing in their rooms. And But before we uh, talk about the Geisterspiele now, maybe we take one more minute to see a um, small sequence from Long Story Short. This film is from 2016 and was a bit differently Uh, in the making of than the uh, found footage works we saw in the last okay. minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll say one thing about it before, which is that just, uh, I did not find this these images of the internet. Because that's sort of, even though I used the kind of forms, I used, uh, I, I used the, same, uh, the same form of people talking to the screen in front of a webcam, but they were all interviews. And, I, and that where I was sitting in the room with, with people. So this is a, I would say the section that I'm going to show, I find it um, right now, given what's happening in the United States and how emotional and difficult it is um, with, with uh, uh, relentless pictures of black death and police violence against uh, black people in America, um, I find it really hard to watch, um, but I still am going to show it. <laughs> so, I mean, just hard and sad. Maybe a warning. It's sad. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to share a screen. And maybe uh, we should explain that the whole film, long story short, is about um, poorness, being poor in public, people talking uh, in this interview situation uh, in in the camera or in the mobile phone or webcam, was it webcam format, 
um, about being poor in public, and then you have different chapters. And now we are watching the chapter neighborhoods and shootings, right? Right, and and yes. So the the film itself um, is is a compilation that where I interviewed hundred uh, over a hundred people around uh, Los Angeles area and San Francisco area where I was living, and asked them to. Um, and I went to um, homeless shelters and to places where people ne were getting food and places where people were getting their high school degrees later. The, it's called the GED in the United States, um, the general education degree. And I asked anyone who wanted to participate if they would um, talk to me about um, their experiences of uh, facing poverty, of what they think people outside of that experience get wrong, what the media gets wrong, and what they think people in, in uh, positions of power and politicians need to know. Okay, so I'm gonna switch to screen sharing and show it now. I grew up in a small town in Arkansas called England, Arkansas, population 3,060 people. There was a set of railroad tracks that ran through the middle of the town, whites on one side, blacks on the other. I grew up in on the wrong side of the street. On my side of the street were ran down apartments and then on the opposite side of the street were upscale condos. The whites owned all the property and the farms and the blacks worked on the farms. But out here in California, I seen only black people. I didn't grow up with many white people around. It was pretty, pretty much, much just us. Hispanics, Hispanics Latinos, Latinos, a lot of African Americans and uh, Mexicans live on the flatlands. It's not like in a very good neighborhood. Not the good areas of LA. And then predominantly um, middle class, rich people, people that people who have good money live, live in, in the hills, hills you know. They don't want to be where the urban people are, you know? They don't want to be where all the poverty is and where all the people who are homeless. It's not, you know I mean, a coincidence. This is done all over the United States. We were like pretty much secluded from the regular city, you know? And they have it all cornered in and contained right there around the police station. The air even smells different <laughs> for some reason. And, and the police is patrolling to make sure that we don't bother the nice neighborhoods. I'll make this more clear. There's not a lot in the neighborhood. It's nothing positive out here. There's so many people out, out of jobs there, out in the street looking for jobs. I would never seen in the, in the suburbs of white neighborhoods. African American men hanging out on a corner. The white guys hanging out at the liquor store. Matter of fact, they didn't even have liquor stores too much in the suburbs. They have liquor barns or, you know. Okay, in, in my, my neighborhood. In Compton is within the. Uh, um, two block radius. You have six you see liquor, liquor stores. stores. We have it's like a, a liquor, liquor store, store on, on every, every corner. corner. You know, uh, do the math. Okay. okay. My name is DeRay, I'm 25. I have a daughter who's four and I currently live at Euclid Villa, which is a homeless shelter. I have been, I have cerebral palsy and I am a very strong person, very outgoing, very motivated, very funny, bubbly person, and that's me. Um, I live in Los Angeles, I don't care to give that out. And this city is full of pretty much millionaires. You know what's funny, half this city is like rich and the other set is poor. And then it's like, you know, oh my God, you live in this place where there's billionaires like right down the street from you. And yet you're struggling just to get insurance and struggling to pay this. And there's a billionaire right down the street. Yeah, it's so funny, but it, it's true. And everybody's like, the city of angels, oh, I can't wait to go to Los Angeles. If, it, if they could see <laughs> that there is a whole nother side that is so poor, like in poverty like really bad, like little hut houses. I don't know why that is, maybe they, I don't know, but I've seen it. And then you go to this beautiful side of, can I say this, uh, Hollywood, and it's like gorgeous, make you wanna cry. The side, my bathroom, their bathroom is bigger than my house. And it's like, holy crap, how do you get there?
my husband, my dad, my boyfriend, boyfriend, one of my cousins, a close cousin of mine. He was by actually being he was shot, shot twice, eight times, six times, in my shoulder, in my leg. By um, LAPD. You know, this officer shot him 26 times. He thought I was a gang member. I wasn't, but I looked the part. And he got hit in a crossfire. Um, he got killed in the streets. On the 21st of this month. One shot to the head, and a few hours later, I got a call that he passed away. That was pretty shocking. So, so, we was 15 years old. After that, it happened. Ever since then, it was like everything stopped. I know I couldn't cope. I just could not function. Like that was four and a half years ago, and it still breaks me down. So, yeah. Uh, and then, I mean, the, the police, police relations, relations with the community is all is terrible. poor in our community. You know, so it's like the good guys is looked at as the bad guys, and the bad guys is admired. Any given day, you can shoot us. Basically, for nothing. nothing. If it's a case of mistaken identity, somebody look like somebody else. They'll be on TV, and you'll get suspension with pay, take a vacation, and you'll be back on the work. And it's not safe. And I'm, I'm, I'm scared to go home. Having to worry about you have to, looking over their shoulders. Be cautious. Over. I have to look over the my shoulders, shoulders sometimes. Of walking down the street to your house. Walking in the house. To make sure there's no one behind me. Because you just trying to know. kill me. Some days it's, 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 it feel good just to be able to walk in a house and not be shot or not be harassed by the police. Yes. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, this is a 45 minute long feel by, by watching only a few minutes and uh, this in this way. Often politicians, for example, speak about poor people, but it's uh, seldom to hear uh, the feelings and experience expressed by people who are poor. And um, especially this chapter we saw now, of course, is kind of super actual because of the uh, that of um, George Floyd, and so I'm a little bit touched now. <laughs> Maybe um, we we start talking about the the new project um, because uh, this sure. kind of combines a lot of things we saw and discussed before, and um, the idea or the invitation which came from me to you was um, very much connected to the experience of the pandemic and of the uh, being in front of a computer, being um, discussing completely uh, com complicated issues uh, via Zoom or um, Skype. And you came up with a very nice idea, which also includes um, the local residents of the rural area. So maybe you can um, introduce us to this, to the Geisterspiele. <laughs> sure. So, so the um, ghost games in English, it's a, it's a, actually a translation of a German term, which means, um, it, which is used uh, when, when football or soccer um, is played without an audience in front of it. And when I learned that, I thought, oh, that's such a great name. And I actually, the name sort of I was going through a series of, of, of project ideas, but that name just stuck because I found it so, so, so relevant right now. Um, and so the, the project, um, it explores, uh, it, 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 it starts really from, uh, from the intimate, like from myself, like from really feeling uh, just, uh, you know, that I, that I, I really miss I miss the close contact with strangers. <laughs> you know, I miss close contact with 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 friends. You know, I mean, it's me and my husband and my cat, right? <laughs> and so, um, and I and I feel like there's no substitute for that kind of physical embodiment with other people, and that we are suffering from that, which is why in the United States everyone is so relieved. Like, you know, why we have uh, what they. they call pandemic fatigue and people are going out. Um, but I was thinking, um, especially at, 
originally the idea, and it and it sort of developed over time. The idea was that that um, the the most caring thing that people can do if they don't have to leave, if they have a home to go to, and they don't have to leave that home to work, um, you know, is to stay at home. Like that, for the first time, caring. You know, caring means keeping physical distance from other people, which is a which is feels like a paradox, right? Because that's not that's not how we understand caring. Uh, it removes so many senses, right? We have we lose the sense of smell of others, the sense of touch. I mean, smell maybe is okay when you're traveling on the subway, but you know, it's still. I think there, there's all of these dimensions to embodiment that we lose. And one of the things that we don't lose is sound. Like sound can travel, so. Um, and sound is also an incredibly intimate um, sense in the sense in the in in the way that when you listen, when you hear a sound, somebody has has either recorded that sound for you or you are in a space listening. So there's always subjectivity attached to it. There's always a body when it comes to. I mean, it's a kind of phenomenological thing, right? There's always a body. So you're either listening or or you're yeah. um, you're making you're making a sound with your own body, and so I thought that, and this is before the protest started, um, but I thought that you know one of the ways that um, uh, I would be really interested in having people make sounds that they make and sounds that they hear when they are in whatever they consider their home, and share the videos with me because I'm interested in the relationship of the image to the sound. Like, what do they see when they hear an ordinary sound? or when they make a ridiculously simple sound like opening a can, or when they listen to quiet. Quiet is also, I think, really important. I mean, quiet was important in long story short because there's so much that, that is unsaid or unspoken, like when people are just sitting, like there's so, there's so much, there's so much um, weight to silence. And, um, and, and, and we are also, especially early on in the pandemic, we, heard sounds differently like we noticed sounds differently because the streets were cleared out yeah. so it sounded really differently and even now in in um and you know where i live in brooklyn uh kids are so bored and tired of and don't have jobs and so every night until two in the morning they set off fireworks which i've recorded because i'm also making sound <laughs> i'm also making videos of sounds um and so i'm asking people to just uh make make uh videos of like pay, start paying attention um, and, and make videos of the sounds that they hear or they make and also make a video out of your window because I think the kind of the, the expansiveness of, of the I mean of what what we are all sharing <laughs> you know I mean we're sharing the pandemic but we're also sharing I mean I think that this is really a time to share and to connect in any way that we can and to be caring like we need it really now more than ever and even thinking about i mean this is a little bit off topic but thinking about the mask like when you wear a mask it's not about protecting yourself first it's about protecting others especially in our country when when mask wearing has become so political um you know in, in our country you know of course our president doesn't wear a mask and his followers follow and don't wear masks so we have no leadership attached to you know, an understanding of public health. So I think like right now it's really, I mean, it always is, but it's really important to, you know, think beyond the, you know, the fiction of the individual to the collective. Cause we are, you know, I mean, our, <laughs> all of our bodies are merged together in a way that, um, you know, causes destruction as well as something productive. So, so anyway, that's, I mean, there's, uh, I, I would ask anyone who's watching this, some people who are watching this are my friends and they've already made sounds and I'm so good. <laughs> I mean, every time I get a, a, a video with, with, you know, in my Dropbox or however they send it, I feel like it's a little gift. You know? Yeah, yeah. I hope yeah. you will get lots yeah. more yeah. After, after the talk. Mm, like the way how to do it, the introduction uh, is on your website and there's also a trailer that uh, one can imagine what... Uh, type of installation could grow out of this material, but of course it's a work in process. And as you said before, you um, kind of work with the material you got, and then there can be a moment where you feel, ah, I need more, I don't know, fireworks or uh, bikes ringing on the street or whatever. So maybe we find these as well. And I'm, I'm looking 
forward very much. I think it's going to be a great concert, like an abstract concert of noises. And I think it fits super good to this uh, situation we are all in uh, with the pandemic. And so I'm looking forward very much. And maybe I hand over to Christina because she mm, maybe has some questions which came in from the chat. Um, but um, I don't, Jack Spring, I don't know if I'm I'm going to be back. Uh, okay, okay, I stay. I stay with you. <laughs> Yes, hello again. Indeed, we have some questions. Um, maybe as a first one, there was a um, question concerning mass ornament, um, which goes, um, do all the people dance to the same song? Because the choreography looks kind of the same. Or is it maybe just a current dancing style many people use? Um, and this maybe leads to another question. Um, which is um, when working with found footage, how do you find it? Do you just go by typing in parking lot into Google, into the Google search engine, and then everything starts from there? Or how does it work? So in the first one, uh, for most of the uh, mass ornament, you can actually watch a document of the whole installation online, because I have the whole thing online. But in everything that, you, that I played here, Uh, they weren't they weren't using the same music so um only at the very end um there's one which is uh, i'm a single lady that everyone is dancing to and you'll recognize the dance moves and can probably dance along too <laughs> um so there are two songs at the end when the when the pictures get even smaller that people are all dancing to but everything else is separate there the music is separate and in fact i i pull out the music and i add a different soundtrack um in the piece uh, and I added, because the work was made uh, during the financial crisis and I was, I was drawing links between the analysis of Krakauer of the 1930s during the Great, uh, during the Great Depression, 20s, the 20s of the 30s to uh, the, that last financial crisis before the one we're in now. Right? And I was interested in sort of the differences and, and similarities be between mass, mass entertainment. Um, so I used, uh, I used two songs, one uh, which was Busby Berkeley's The Triumph of, uh, sorry, Busby Berkeley, who is a, um, a, a, a filmmaker and a choreographer from uh, Hollywood who made these spectacular mass ornaments of bodies, masses of beautiful dancer bodies in configuration uh, that produced what looked like a mass ornament. And I used uh, uh, Lenny Riefenstahl's uh, Triumph of the of the will because I wanted to look at other ways that bodies moved in formation in a more um, you know sort of frightening <laughs> way that can lead to fascism of course um, and so inter intermixed with that I also added sounds of bodies that didn't exist because I wanted to both make it feel like a collective and also remind us of the separation and of the of the bodies in in the space so. Uh, I forgot that rest of that question, except, yeah, no, they were, they were uh, dancing to different songs. And then the second one was, I forgot. Um, it was um, about the process of finding your, your footage. So do you just go by typing in parking lot into Google or, or how yeah. do you find it? So the, the search engines have, again, changed dramatically since I was, since I was searching. As, as do the videos now, if you searched for things, I think what would rise to the top are, you know, are um, things produced by major uh, companies or media outlets. But uh, when I was searching, I actually ran out, I was doing one that was about people losing their job. And I thought about, I, I, I searched for everything, every expression that I could think of in English and in other languages about, well, No, it, that was only English because because it, it was about because uh, it was using words. But every variation of losing your job, I searched for, and I got everything. <laughs> you know, now you could never ever do that because there's so there's so many videos. So with dancing, uh, with the dancing, I searched for every variation that I could come up with with dancing alone in my room. A lot of them were me dancing. Um, so uh, yeah. So I just I just would come up with variations, and that one I did in different languages because I didn't 
I wasn't using words, so I could edit people from all around the world. So yeah, I, and I dig to the bottom of the search engines. So I would, I would not do the top results. Usually the top results were not so interesting, but I would dig deeper and deeper into the search engine to the ones that you know, don't rise above uh, the rest. <laughs> hmm. The ones with lesser views. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the ones that are not sponsored. Right, not sponsored. I mean, there were less sponsor. There was much less sponsorship back then. I think it would be impossible to do mm -hmm. that work now. It would be impossible to do that work because because people don't use the internet in the same way now. And and you know, you don't. I, I think spontaneity happens in different places now, or maybe it doesn't. I mean, like Instagram is so curated, and uh, Twitter is often. I mean, there's no image often. So it's just, I mean, the, the internet is a really different place today. I don't think you could do it. And it really feels nostalgic in some way looking at that work because there is a kind of vulnerability that people will uh, allow that I think can't happen anymore because of, I mean, we learned our lessons. People learned, that, I mean, not that I did that kind of work, but people really learned their lessons by the harshness of, of, the, of the comments, you know, and the, and the popularity um, like, yeah, that it's a really vicious place, the internet. So especially the confessional works uh, that, that I think that people were really looking for, um, you know, they were looking for a space to be seen and to be heard and to have a public. And I, I think it's much, much harder, much harder to do that if you're, if you have any vulnerability whatsoever about you, if you're, you know, a woman, if you're a person of color, it's really hard. <laughs> To do that kind of to do that kind of work online. Um, we have another another question, um, and it's more general. Um, it says, um, "How is life in New York right now? Are you hopeful for real change?" Uh, the protests have have already. I mean, they've been. It's been amazing, and there's already there is already change in uh even though it's not enough <laughs> at all and we're scared that that to be optimistic because we've been optimistic before and have been disappointed um i feel like there's a change right now but i can't uh, that there is already that there's there's a certain way that i think uh white people feel pressure even if they don't necessarily agree but they feel the pressure of the movement To, to reflect on themselves and, and, on, and on systematic racism you know, within institutions. And that's being cynical because I think that there are a lot of people who you know, suddenly have, been in, have, have had a realization too. But then the question of the election, I think that if you're American and you're listening to this, you know that you know, it, it's gonna take a lot of work. Like we can't expect anything. So I'm, I, I guess I would say that I am cautiously optimistic. But there was also this very nice move of the younger generation on TikTok uh, to reserve tickets for Trump's tour. It was just in today's booth and then not to show up. So that made him to um, talk in front of 6,000 people instead of 20,000 or millions, as he announced before. And I think this is like a very powerful uh, statement how the internet can be used politically again and with all these tricks. They kind of, <laughs> they, they beat him with their, his own weapons, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's true. I think that the machine on the on the right and other countries supporting that and misinformation is really, really powerful. And there are so many interests at play, you know, sort of outside of the United States and that can weaponize the Internet. I mean, the Internet is a vile place for this. So it's true. And it, it's true that that that, you know, the left can use use these tactics, too. But I think that um, it's going to take more like on the ground work, whatever that means for people, like making phone calls. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I think for the elections in, in November, it's still, we can't, we can't expect anything. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Christina, nice to meet. Yeah. Um, is there another question or shall we kind of? Um, get to the end slowly. Yeah, there's one last question. Um, how do you manage the credits from the video creators? Speaking of copyright, 
Do you ask for permission for using their footage? So the, the, only, uh, the only video, so the work that I use on YouTube, uh, where I, when I use things on YouTube, I can't because there's just too many and people don't, wouldn't respond. And what I've done some work, for example, with, the, with some of the shorter videos where I used less people, like when people were losing their jobs, I posted response videos to everybody who was in, in the uh, piece uh, to show them what I had made. And a few responded in a positive way and a few didn't, didn't most didn't write back. Um, with the dance videos, I didn't ask for permission because there were too many. And as I said before, it's not, well, actually I can explain copyright. The copyright law is that once you put something on the internet, uh, the copyright is uh, Google owns your material. So you don't own it um, or on Facebook, you don't own it. And um, so I guess I would have had to ask permission from Google and I wasn't gonna do that. <laughs> um, and as I said before, I just thought there is something called, well, the, another, another question about that is uh, there is something that is called fair use in terms of copyright. And if you are using material made by somebody else um, to comment or reflect on it in a way, uh, in any way that's educational or enlightening and doesn't claim that it's your own material, you're allowed to use it. So I'm not I'm not saying that it's my material. I, I'm I'm not saying I made that video, right? I'm I'm leaving it, uh, you know, sort of as it is, and we're we're looking at it for what it is, which is someone else. I mean, that's what makes it interesting is that you think about like sort of what the the conditions that led to somebody putting a video online like that, right? As opposed to you thinking I am a great dancer because I made that video. So it's a really big difference. So, but with, a, with um, the piece that I'm doing now and with long story short, I, I, I not only asked permission, I mean, they knew what they were getting into. They said they wanted to make a video. When they, I explained my project, I invited anybody who was in the organization at the time that I attended to talk about the work to participate if they were interested in making their views public. And then they got credit for uh, participating in the film. Um, and for this project that I'm doing now, um, if you want to share a video, I would love it. And if you want to have your name included in the credits on my website afterwards, when we finally put it online, and I'll probably put credits online before we put the video online because it will first be shown um, in the, in the um, site that we find in Germany, um, then you also, you can get credit for the, your participation. If you don't want to get credit, uh, let me know or just you know, submit anonymously. I was just thinking if we shouldn't show the trailer you made, maybe this is a nice, end of the talk and, uh, and also like to in again invite people to participate uh, and I would like to thank you Natalie very much uh, for talking to us it was super interesting and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the future and to the project we are still looking for the perfect site but we will find it I'm, I'm sure uh, okay. to show the installation and I also want to thank uh, Christina, Fabio and Lex from the team of Urbane Kutsuruhe for supporting this uh, first uh, Vanna Salon on air. And then I say goodbye from my side. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. It was really, it was really nice. And thank you all for uh, organizing it and, and handling the technology. I know it's a first <laughs> and it'll get easier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm, it, I'm going to show a, a two minute teaser. Uh, a lot of it is featuring me and my cat and a few with my husband, <laughs> a few that I found, <laughs> uh, and a few that my friends and family sent to me. Uh, and it was just a, a, a test that I was doing so that I could send out to people who were interested in participating so they could kind of get some general idea of what I'm doing. Okay, so I'm going to share my, I'll say, I'll share. I'm gonna say goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much, everyone, and also for people who are listening. Okay.
Experience of his life. 